and the title of the message this morning is Representing Jesus. Representing Jesus. You know, <clears throat> uh, love is a wonderful thing, isn't it? It's a wonderful thing, and, uh, but yet in many ways, it's something that's not very well understood by most people. You know, there's a love that parents have for their children and the love that children have for their parents. And that's a different kind of love than, uh, than the romantic love like that a husband has for his wife and a wife has for her husband. And that's a different kind of love than the love that uh, we have for the Lord and that the Lord has for us. And this morning scripture, um, the Lord is telling us that disciples are to have love one for each other, right? And while all these, <clears throat> excuse me, forms of love are different, they all have something in common. And I put this in your bulletin. You cannot hand someone your love. If you and I do not act on our love, our love does the object of our love no good, right? You know, if I do not act in a loving way toward my wife, toward Sandy, the fact that I love her does no good, right? And uh, recently I posted something, you might have seen it, I posted it um, on our church page, and it's gotten a lot of attention online. And uh, I said this, a good Christian church will love on you by making sure that you are saved, right? First and foremost, what is the greatest way we could love somebody? And that is to share the gospel with them and make sure that they're saved. Amen? Helping you to grow in God's word. So once we make sure that you're saved, then helping you to uh, understand God's word and, you know, uh, more and more and more. Helping you to obey God's word. You know, we all are here for each other and should be here for each other to help each other obey God's word. I also put, also by showing you your value to the church, being thankful that for you and, uh, you know, and showing it and being there for you in times of need, right? That's all the various ways and there are probably others that we can love on each other uh, as a good church. But let's hear more about how um, the Lord wants us to, uh, to love this morning. So John chapter 13, okay? Verse 1 reads, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. You know, first, uh, first John chapter 4, verse 19 says this, We love him because he first loved us, right? So the only way, the only reason we can love God at all is because he first loved us. Ephesians chapter 5, 25 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That's a pretty high standard, isn't it? He's saying, husbands, love your wife like the Lord Jesus loves you. And, you know, gave his life for us. And Romans 5, 8 says, but God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that's one of the things that we point out to people when we go out knocking on doors, soul winning sometimes. You know, we point out, do you realize that our Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth to save his enemies. Do you realize that? While we were yet sinners. You know, so it's not like we were already saved and he's just kind of coming to wish us well or something. We were against him. Before you got saved, whether you knew it or not, you, are, you were on the side of the devil. I was on the side of the devil. But he died for me. He died for you. Look at verse 2. 
And supper being ended, the devil, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Now, you will hear a lot of false preaching that will tell you that Judas Iscariot was saved, but he lost his salvation. And they will use this verse to try to prove to you that he lost his salvation. Yeah, because um, Satan put in his heart to, to do this, right? Now, we could be, stay here all day talking about various verses that, um, that prove that salvation is eternal, right? Uh, that once you're saved, you're always saved, uh, sealed with the Holy Ghost, okay? But that aside, what did the Lord Jesus himself say about Judas Iscariot? In John chapter 6, verse 70, you might remember us reading, he said, Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? Now, this is before this, uh, what we're reading today, right? This was before. He knew that he picked the twelve, and that one of them was a devil. So let me ask you something. Uh, was the Lord Jesus fooled? You know, did he pick Judas Iscariot thinking, wow, that Judas is a swell guy. He's a faithful guy. You know, and only to be betrayed? Of course not. Do we see anywhere in the scripture it say that our Lord Jesus was surprised? You know, oh, I didn't know that he was going be, to betray me. Of course not. He was not tricked. He was not fooled. I put this in your bulletin. The Lord Jesus came to the earth to die for us. He picked Judas knowing that eventually Satan would use him to betray the Lord. Judas was not saved. Period. We're going to talk more about that here in a moment. Look at verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he raiseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. So our Lord Jesus doing this. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and say, said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Because you know, here's the Lord, right? Uh, you know, who am I for you to wash my feet? Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. You know, wash me all over, Lord, if, if that's what you want. And Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but notice this, but not all. For he knew who should betray him, therefore he said, said he, ye are not all clean. So verse 11 again shows us, it's a, referring to Judas Iscariot, and shows us that he was not saved. That's what that's talking about there, when it first did not being clean. Verse 12, so after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, know ye what I have done to, ye, to you? Ye call me master and Lord, and ye say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know, now get a load of verse 17. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. 
happy are ye if ye do them. Verse 17 is a, um, a verse that I haven't heard a whole lot of preaching on. Doesn't mean that, there, that it's not out there. I just haven't heard it over the years. Uh, I think many times when pastors come to, you know, uh, this chapter and these verses, um, you know, they get caught up in some of the other things, which is fine. You know, there are different things to preach on. But many times they overlook this very thing here. Verse 17, if you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. But I put this in your notes. This is a concept all throughout the Bible that happiness comes from serving others and doing things for other people. So people today who are consistently unhappy are those who tend to be self-absorbed, self-centered people. Now, I don't mean that they're arrogant, and I don't mean that they only think about themselves. I'm not saying that at all. But they spend a whole lot of time feeling sorry for their own plight. You see what I'm getting at? Their own situation. So if a person tends to be self-absorbed and self-centered in that way, and things go bad for them, they're likely to depress themselves over what's going on, those bad things. But if a person tends to be selfish and things go well for them, then there's an empty feeling. And I put this in your notes. When you do things for only yourself and when you receive great things only for yourself, there is an emptiness about it. There's an emptiness. You know, an example of this is King Solomon. King Solomon. He lived for himself, King Solomon did. The Bible says he withheld not from himself any pleasure or any joy. You know, he had all the money in the world. He had all the women. He had all the riches, right? He had all the power, all the entertainment, all the wisdom, all the knowledge, education, but what did he say? He, he essentially said, I hate life. You know, it's all vanity. It's all worthless. It's a waste. So I put this in your notes. The Bible teaches that you will be happy if you learn to think of others, serve others, put others first. The Lord said, look, if you know these things, that's one thing but happy are you if you do them, right? It's one thing to know it. It's another thing to do it. Acts chapter 20, verse 35 says this. I have showed you all things, how, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, if you look up the word blessed in the Bible, you know, do a search for the word blessed in the Bible, um, you'll find many times where it says blessed, other times where this, there's the same meaning, uh, it says happy, okay? So the word blessed and happy tends to be used interchangeably uh, throughout, throughout the Bible. Like sometimes it'll say, blessed is the man that this or that, and some, uh, sometimes it'll say happy is the man this or that because when you are blessed by God uh, you will be happy do you agree with that amen, amen. you're going to be happy when God's blessing you and the Bible says it is more blessed to give than receive you will be happier if you give more happier when you give than when you receive And the Bible says that we ought to labor or work to give. Hard work to support the weak. And if we do that, we'll be blessed. We'll be happy. Okay? So now please hold your spot and turn to Philippians chapter 2, if you would. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. 
Okay, everyone there. The Bible reads in uh, verse 1, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of spirit, if any uh, uh, bowels of mercy and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, you know, trying to, to bring glory upon yourself and all that, but in lowliness of mind, let each, let each esteem other better than themselves. Let each esteem other better than themselves. And I put this in your bulletin. To esteem means to regard, to value, right? So you need to be more important to me than I am to myself. That's what it means. If I'm esteeming you better than myself, it means I am, you are more important to me than I am to myself. And we need to put each other ahead of ourselves. Your well-being needs to be more important to me than my own well-being. And my well-being needs to be more important to you than your own well-being. You see? And that's how that works. Look at, look at verse 4 there. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. You know, in today's society, we have this mind your own business attitude, right? Uh, uh, Kamala Harris's running mate, Tim Wall, said um, uh, that uh, we have this sort of attitude in Minnesota, uh, mind your own business, although he threw in an expletive there. Yeah, I'm sure that doesn't come to when you are earning money. I'm sure they, they mind that business. Uh, but anyhow, um, but... But so what is Paul saying here in verse 4? I put this in your bulletin. Do not just concern yourself with what's going on in your own life, but check on others. See what's going on with them. Help them the best that you can. You know, when we live in our own little world of me, myself, and I, that's when we get ourselves into trouble, you know? And that's when we are really essentially useless to others. It's very difficult to serve others if you're not paying attention to what's going on, right? If you're not listening to people, seeing what they need. And you know, social media is a real pain, isn't it? I mean, really, it is. It's a pain. But the one good thing about social media is that, is that sometimes we learn things about others that we wouldn't have known otherwise, you know? I mean, like, uh, uh, I'm sorry? Good and bad. Yeah, good and bad, yeah. Like, um, a few weeks ago, I learned that a, a friend of mine, we always got along so well in, in high school. Uh, we weren't close friends in high school, but anytime we we run into each other in the store or something, we'll stand there and talk for a while, you know? Um, but his wife posted uh, the thing that, um, you know, if you notice weird things from him, it's because he has dementia, you know, and I wouldn't have known it, you know, I wouldn't have known to pray for him, uh, you know, you, see, you know, all the different things you wouldn't, we never knew unless we ran into somebody or someone called, hey, did you hear what happened, you know, so there's the positive side of that, but there's a whole lot of negative too, obviously. Look at verse 5, uh, continuing in Philippians. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. In other words, think like Jesus thinks. Okay? Look, verse 6. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now, that's what, we're, we're not going to do that, right? Because we're not God. So what this is saying is that the Lord Jesus did not think he was stealing from the Father to be equal with the Father because he is, right? He wasn't stealing from the glory of, of the Father uh, because he is equal to the Father. Verse 7, but made himself of no reputation 
and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So, you know, we, there is no way for us to comprehend what it is like to be God. You know, there is no way that we can relate to that. We cannot relate to what it must have been like for God to humble himself, to come into a body like ours. You realize Jesus had a body just like ours, right? You know, and I mean, just think how humbling that is to do that and to suffer in the different ways that we suffer and all those things. We cannot comprehend being infinitely, perfectly sinless, but yet having all of the sins placed on him, you know, and dying on the cross for us, bearing the weight of all of that sin. We, we just, we can't relate to it. There's no way for us to comprehend that. Look at verse 9. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow uh, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He's not saying you, you work to be saved. He's saying, you know, act it out. In other words, you know, uh, now that you're saved, go and do for the Lord. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So why are we able to, to do what God wants us to do? Because God's doing it through us. Okay? All right, so back to, to John 13 then. So here we have the Lord Jesus, the creator of the world, the one who holds everything together, the Bible tells us, bending down, washing the dirty, smelly feet of the disciples. And the Lord is saying here, hey, we are not better than he is. We need to do the same thing. And it occurs to me that sometimes pastors think that they're above the church members. You know, that sometimes, sometimes you even see them like make this grand entrance, like, oh, there he is. You know, any kind of thing. Uh, you know what I mean? But, uh, and, and in their minds, they might think, sometimes they think, and sometimes you see them act it out by, you know, well, this job isn't, you know, it's, too, it's for someone else. You know, uh, uh, pastor shouldn't have his hand in the commode trying to unclog it that kind of thing. You know, some jobs are just beneath the pastor is the attitude that they have. And here we have our Lord Jesus Christ washing their feet. You see what I'm talking about here? You know, this whole business of Pastor Appreciation Month, which uh, apparently is going on right now. You know, I grew up Catholic, as most of you know. I'd never heard of this before. Now, what is this? You know, Pastor's Appreciation Month. And at first, you know, the, the Baptist church that we were going to, you know, I went along with this whole path. Matter of fact, I remember one, one uh, Sunday, um, they asked me if I could preach that Sunday, you know, and, and it was about the two pastors and hooray for the pastors and all that. Like, that's what we were there for. You know what I mean? Then, by the grace of God... I became one, and I made it clear I don't want people gushing over me. You know, I sure appreciate your love, and I pray that you appreciate my love toward you. But we're not here for me. It's not about me. Amen? Amen. The 
that's the point. So anyway, the Lord tells us we're to love on people, serve them, and by doing so, you will be happy. And what's interesting to me is that uh, many people seek church. Many people seek the Lord for happiness, right? Hoping that the Lord will bless them in different ways. You know, I hope that by going to church, someone will bless, uh, the Lord will bless me with a mate. You know, I, I've been wanting a mate, and I hope I'll get a mate by going to church. Or I hope that by going to church, I'll have better finances, and then I'll be happy, right? Or I hope that by going to church, the Lord will bless me so that I'll no longer be depressed or anxious or angry or, you know, addicted or any of those things. But in reality, what is the Lord saying here? If you want to be happy, do what? Yeah, serve others, help others. That's what he's saying. Take care of others. And so when these people that I just mentioned that have these, these wrong motivations, when they hear this, no, if you want to be happy, serve others. What do you think they do? They Right, they take off. They take off. They split. Right? But in many churches, they do not hear that. Instead, what they hear is, God wants you to be rich. Right? God wants you to be rich. But in fact, God wants us to serve. God wants us to serve. Okay? So look at verse 18. I speak not of all of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it come, that when it has come to pass, ye may believe that I am he. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified, and said, Verily, verily, I say, which means like, truly, truly, right? I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one to another, doubting of whom he spake. So notice something here. So, so he's saying, hey, one of you is going to be, betray me, right? So what are the disciples doing? They're all looking at each other. Well, I wonder which one it's going to be. So what does that tell you about Judas Iscariot? That he did a good enough job blending in for them to not know, right? That it would be him. Judas was not saved, but he blended in so well that they didn't know he would be the one. In other words, when the Lord Jesus said, one of you is gonna betray me, they didn't all do this to Judas Iscariot, right? They didn't all turn to him, well, must be him. We, you know, uh, we had our doubts. The Bible doesn't even say that anyone suspected it would be him. Right? So let me ask you, what do you think the implications are for today? Why do we need to make certain that people who worship with us are saved? Why do I as the pastor, and you all as well, need to talk with every one of you and new folks that come in to make certain that you're saved. You know, do you know for sure that when you die, you're going to heaven? Well, first of all, it's because we love people and we want to make sure that they spend eternity in heaven with us, right? Someone shared the gospel with us. We want to share the gospel with others. But secondly, we do not want unsaved people to hang out with us long enough to cause trouble. Are actual Christians able to cause trouble in a church? Sure they are. But how much more so people who aren't saved, who have ulterior motives for being a part of a church family, right? 
And sometimes, and I've been alerted to this, uh, you know, sometimes people will come up to me and say, uh, you know, this person that has been sitting next to me for a while said something that, you know, something came out of her mouth, and I think, oh, I'm not so sure she believes the gospel. Yeah, yeah, and that's good. We need to hear that, right? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So if you let people talk long enough, you'll hear what they believe, right? And that's a good thing because, you know, um, then we can know. So I put this in and help them. I put this in your bulletin. One of the reasons that unsaved people hang out at many churches is because those churches never preach anything that offends them. I put, they don't preach about hell, for example, so they never hear anything that's offensive to someone who's not a believer. You see? So it's easy for them to just keep hanging out and hearing the gospel and rejecting it over and over again which is a, uh, a very, very dangerous thing if a person ever wants to be saved. And, um, and so you know, it's important for us. But like I said, by far the most important reason is we want people to be saved. Okay. Look at verse 23. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved, and that's referring to John, right? It's Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. He then lying on Jesus' breast saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, that thou doest, do quickly. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. For some of them thought, because Judas had the bag, that Jesus had said unto him, buy those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So you notice that these disciples are clueless, you know. Uh, they, they don't know what's going on here. They're just not getting it. And maybe the Lord wanted it that way because otherwise they might have tried to stop Judas, you know? Verse 30. He, th he then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whether I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. So the Lord is talking about believers here, but more specifically, those who are following him, serving him as disciples, right? He says, look, they will all, people will know you are a follower of mine, referring to Jesus talking about himself, right? If you love each other. And so is the Lord saying here, if you love each other by uh, love you, you know, by simply saying, love you, man. Huh? Is that what he's talking about here? It, oh, sure, nice to see you. Is that what he's talking about here? I mean, that includes that, right? But what does it also include? Showing it by helping each other, taking care of each other, being there for each other. Now, I will say this much. Unless, the, unless God enlightens us to a need that someone has that we're not aware of, how, how are we to know? You know? Because we're not mind readers, you know? So a lot of people suffer in silence. And you know what? To be honest with you, it, it's not fair to your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not fair to your church family 
because you're robbing them of an opportunity to help you. You see? To do what God wants us to do by just kind of keeping quiet and, and, and look. Uh, I don't care what's going on in your life. Uh, you know, we've all had, you know, our, our times, you know. Uh, we've all done things that we wish we hadn't done, you know. So for anyone to look down their nose at anybody, you know, it's just ridiculous. So I put this in your bulletin. We should love on each other so much, showing each other so much Christian brotherly and sisterly love that people observing us think, I want that. I want to be a part of that. There is something about them that is different. And what is it? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. Yet, in, in our American church, you know, in, our, in the so-called modern church, you know, probably of the last uh, at least 100 years or so, you know, churches have developed these habits of folks only seeing each other on Sundays. You know, um, you know, the church family only seeing each other maybe on Wednesday evenings as well. But other than that, having very little interaction with, with each other. You know, um, or, or after the service, people taking off like the building's on fire. You know, rather than, you know what I mean? Rather than sticking around and, hey, how you doing? And, you know, uh, do you need help with anything? And, you know, let me pray for you or, you know, what have you. Because it seems to me like, you know, just taking off and see you next week and all that, it's kind of the opposite of what God is talking about here. Verse 36, Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither thou goest? Jesus answered him, whether I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life. For thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. So he's, uh, you're going to deny me three times before you hear from the old rooster. And sometimes we can all relate to Peter, can't we? You know, we have the best of intentions. But then, you know, when we're actually in the situation, fear crops up or doubt or some other factors come into play, and we just don't get the job done. So, look, here's the thing. The bottom line is this. We as a church family need to love on each other. We need to love on other true Christians as well. We need to serve others, take care of people. Doing so will not only make the Lord happy with us, but God is telling us this morning, it will make us happy as well. Amen? Amen. But none of this matters if you're not saved. So if there's anyone here who doesn't know for sure that when you die, you're going to heaven, uh, please see me after the service be glad to show you how you can know the true gospel why do we call our church free gift baptist church because salvation is a free gift right jesus paid the price we accept that free gift by trusting what he did that thing that i uh, mentioned to you that i posted someone um Someone responded to it. Are you one of those Baptist churches that doesn't believe that Jesus is divine? I, think I, I know of no Baptist church that thinks that. You know? Um, of course we believe in the deity of Christ. Jesus is God in the flesh. You know? Um, he is. He's the only one who could could pay the price for our sins. We needed someone to live a perfect, sinless life. And that's what our Lord Jesus did. Praise God. So, 
All right. Well, let's. Uh, did you did you let the? Oh, fantastic. All right. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for uh, your word. Help us, Lord, to um, love on each other the way you want us to love on each other, to serve each other, to take care of each other. No, no matter how lowly that the task might seem to be. Um, uh, help us, Lord, to humble ourselves. Uh, to you know, to stop being so full of ourselves, and, and to uh, follow your Son's example, and and to take care of people, and to and uh, to love on them, and and um, please write these truths on our hearts, Lord, so that we just don't leave here and uh, and you know, just it's just like a vapor. No, help us, Lord, to to have these truths stick with us and to, to act on them, to live by them. In the Lord Jesus' name we pray, amen.